Well, I just want to say thank you again for joining us. I hope you've got your Bible, got some coffee. Let's dive into the Word together. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's where we're going to continue our study uh, through the book of First Peter. And I was reading this week of the story of Andrew Jackson before he became the seventh president of the United States. He was a commander of the Tennessee militia. And during the War of 1812, as the story goes, his troops, the morale of his troops had reached an all-time low. And a critical spirit had grown among them. They were, there was some infighting and, and they were arguing and bickering and fighting among themselves. And so reportedly, Jackson called them all together and, and uh, when things had kind of reached a breaking point, and when all the men were assembled, Jackson stood in front of them and he pointed across the battlefield and he said to them, gentlemen, let's remember that the enemy is over there. W when you read the story of the gospels, you'll see that the disciples had some trouble at times with infighting. They were often arguing about who would be the greatest in God's kingdom. In fact, in Luke chapter 9, there, there was a dispute as to which of them would be the greatest. And again, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus uh, talked to his disciples about it because while they were walking on the way, they had been fighting again about who would be the greatest. In Mark chapter 10, when Jesus told his disciples that he was going to suffer and die, James and John came to Jesus and they asked him if he, he would allow them to sit on his right hand, meaning his, his hand of authority and power when he was in glory. And the other disciples got wind of that and they were really angry about it. In Matthew chapter 20, it, it even got to the point where James and John's mom entered into the picture to have the same discussion about her sons. And you might recall that when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he told his disciples that he was going to suffer and that they were all going to flee him that night and uh, flee because of the persecution. And Peter told Jesus he, he wouldn't do it, that he would never abandon the Lord, that he was willing uh, to die for, for Jesus. Uh, do the disciples sound like anyone that you might be familiar with? Because to me, they sound like a lot of what I've seen going on in our culture today. They sound a lot like what I've seen in churches. They sound a lot like what I see Christians doing to each other uh, more times than I would care to admit. This life is like a battlefield. And Peter had been, has been writing this letter uh, to, the, to the Jews and, and to the people who were dispersed in the Roman Empire. And they were facing tremendous persecution. And he reminded them that we're in a battlefield uh, for the purity of our minds in the, in the midst of a very wicked and evil uh, world. And rather than readying their minds for battle, Christians often turn their minds and their hearts against one another. Some of the greatest damage that's done to churches, and I would even say to the Christian cause, um, is not done often by enemy fire. Many times the problems come from within. And this same Peter, who had been vying for power and trying to one-up his disciples in some ways at the Lord's Supper when he, he pledged his allegiance to Christ, now issues a call to these believers about, that are about to face persecution in, in the most fierce battle of their lives. He calls them and reminds them of a critically important principle. And that principle is this, that we need each other. And so Peter calls them to love one another. I want us to continue our study beginning in verse 22 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That first phrase of verse 22, having purified your souls, it actually it connects what he's saying here with what Peter had just previously talked about in just a few verses before, and that is their personal holiness. Our holiness before God, whether we live as holy people as God has called us to live, has very real ramifications in our lives. It moves us, our holiness before God actually moves us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what Peter calls them to in these verses. But he uses two different words for love. He, he begins by saying sincere brotherly love. And that's a love that is really for a brother or a friend. But then he says to love one another earnestly from a pure love. And that word love is agape love. And that is the highest form of love. It's a self-sacrificing and unconditional love for other people. And by its nature, true love is sincere and pure. It's not something that you can manufacture, something that's cheap and artificial and is selfish. 
when I was a youth pastor, I, my kids that were in my youth group used to pick on me because I would go down to Eckerd Drugs. I, I don't think Eckerd is in existence anymore, but at Eckerd Drugs, they used to sell like the, the knockoff versions of soda. And so you'd have all these different names. And I was at the time, I drank Dr. Pepper all the time. And so it was cheaper to get the Eckerd version, which was Dr. Rific. And I would buy Dr. Rific because it fit within our youth budget. And I would take it to the events and the kids hated it because it just wasn't the real thing. If you've ever had Dr. Pepper, you know that Dr. Rific, Dr. Rific is not real. It's not as good. And, and you, you know the difference between real love and a fake love. Uh, real love is when someone loves you sincerely and not for themselves, but for your good. And you know when someone is loving you sincerely or when someone is loving you for selfish reasons. And I want you to remember this today. Sincere love takes hard work. In fact, I, I'd like you to just type that out there in the comments or maybe write it in, your, in the margins of your Bible. Sincere love requires hard work. I think we've kind of given into this idea culturally that love is easy. When, when we're loving people, everybody's going to be lovable all the time. But I want you to notice the wording that, that Peter uses in verse 22. A sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That word earnestly sometimes is translated fervently. And it, it, some people are easy to love, but even the most lovable person is not lovable all the time. And it takes some work. In fact, that word there that is translated uh, sincerely or excuse me, earnestly or fervently, it means to exert oneself with all of one's energy, striving with all of one's energy to stretch. It's drawn, the, the word is drawn from the world of athletics when a runner might stretch for the finish line or exert themselves to the point of exhaustion. Years ago in 2001, I entered the Houston Fire Department Fire Academy. <clears throat> and in the seven months of training, you kind of look forward to what's called the endurance burn. The endurance burn is the final burn of the fire academy. And so you do different burns throughout to kind of learn how to do search and rescue, how to actually put out the fires. But the endurance burn is a simulation. And in order to pass the endurance burn, you have to work without stopping for 30 minutes. And so you kind of, you know, they have this fire truck set up and you, you act like you're pulling up to a scene and you go to the officer who's in charge and they give you a command. And it might be to stretch a certain hose out to a certain length and, and prepare it there. And then it might be to use a pipe pole or some other tool and they'll send you down in the basement to uh, do some search and rescue. And all the while the building is burning and it's extremely excruciating work and it, it's very rigorous and you know, you're constantly working one activity or one job after the next. And when you get that job complete, you come back to the officer and you keep working. And the way that you pass the test is you have to work continuously for 30 minutes without quitting. But here's the catch, they don't put a clock up and so you don't know. And so internally you might think that you've worked 30 minutes but you've only worked 10. And what you have to do in the endurance burn is they make you work and to the point where you simply cannot go anymore. And I remember that I was working uh, on the endurance burn with my partner and we had done a bunch of tasks. We had done some searching, we had knocked the fire down. We had gone to you know all these different things, used the two man pipe pole. And then we got to the point where he said, I want you to take a salvage cover and put it over some of the furniture in the burn building. And the salvage cover is just a really heavy, very thick kind of tarp. And we went over to the fire truck and I just remember reaching my hand up to turn the knob uh, to open up or turn the handle to open up that compartment on the fire truck. And I was so exhausted, I couldn't even turn the handle. And that's the idea of, of the word fervently or sincerely and earnestly in this verse. It means to spend yourself completely. Sincerely loving others is not a feeling. It's a matter of the will. Sincerely loving others is forgiving when the offense seems unforgivable. Sincerely loving others means treating people with kindness even if they treat you poorly. Sincerely loving others means not holding grudges when you would probably be justified in the minds of many to do so. You see, to sincerely love someone else, it requires hard work. It's not going to be easy. And so we have to do it with sincerity, but we have to do it earnestly. That's the word that Peter uses. To exert all of ourselves for loving others because sincere love requires hard work. 
And loving others, notice what he says in, the, in that verse, that it purifies our souls. Now, we often think of our purity with things that are unholy and impure things like dirty sins. And we might think of lust or fornication or pride or being prejudiced, holding grudges, bitterness, and all of those things you know, can corrupt our souls. But obedience to the truth of God's word, he says, that's how we purify ourselves. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for or toward a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Our love for others is not to be stagnant. It's to be growing. And you will see this as Peter develops the thought in this passage. But the first thing I want you to remember today is that sincere love requires hard work. Now let's look at verse 23 as he continues. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Verse 23 is connected to verse 22. You'll see that it's all part of uh, one sentence. Having purified your souls by obedience and that leading to love for one another, he goes on in verse 23 to remind them that they have been born again. And this is where our life in Christ and our love for other people begins to grow. It begins in our relationship with God. In this verse, what Peter does is he connects our love for others with something that's so important. And I want you to hear what he says at the end of verse 23 through the living and abiding word of God. Our love for others is deeply connected to our adherence or our being rooted in the word of God. He reminds us that we were born again, not with something that's tarnished and perishing, but with the eternal and perfect word of God. Our first birth was a birth of the flesh when you were born, and that's corruptible. But our spiritual, our spiritual birth is something that doesn't fade away. And what happens many times is we try to love people in our own strength, in our own flesh. But he goes on in the next verse, verse 24, which we'll read in just a few moments, to remind them that whatever we do with our flesh is going to decay. In fact, notice in verse 24, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. I talk to a, a lot of couples and do marriage counseling from time to time. And I'm, I'm always struck by people that are really struggling, especially those who feel like uh, they need to, they're, they're wanting to get a divorce. And inevitably, as you begin to talk through the various issues that have brought them to that place, they will eventually say this. They say, we just have fallen out of love with each other. We don't love each other in the way that we do, uh, that we did. And I believe that the root cause of that is their love is not rooted where it needs to be. It's rooted in themselves. And look, if, if we were to do everything by what we want or by our own wishes, then yeah, we can fall out of love. But when we root our idea of love not in our ideas and in our thoughts, but in the word of God, that's when we can love sincerely as Peter calls us to live. The best that man can manufacture will fade and will decay, but sincere love endures. And here's what I want you to write. Maybe write this in the comments as well to remember this. Sincere love not only requires hard work, but write this, sincere love is rooted in the word of God. Peter continues in chapter two and verse one. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Chapter two begins with the word so and that means that he's continuing to build on what he's just said on the implications of our love relationship as brothers and sisters in God's family and the work of the word of God in all of that, he says, so you're to put these things away. And in verse one, Paul gives five deterrents to sincere love. And I think that, that we're all in the crosshairs here because I think as we read this list, we may find ourselves more often than we'd like to think. But notice the first one in verse one is the word malice. And that's an attitude that is similar to hatred. It's a desire to inflict 
pain, harm, or injury on another person. You ever had someone hurt you? And rather than respond in love to them, you want to do exact revenge? Or maybe you held a grudge against that person. Maybe you gave them the silent treatment or walked away from a relationship. I think if we were truthful today, we could probably take out a pen and just write a name of someone that we have done that to. And Peter says, sincere love puts away malice. The second deter, uh, deterrent excuse me, to sincere love is in, in verse 1. It's, the, it's deceit. That word means deliberate dishonesty. It's to speak or to act with ulterior motives. That can be sometimes speaking less than the full, full and honest truth with someone. It can be being selfish or two-faced towards someone else or living kind of a double life. So he says, look, if we're going to love with sincere love, we have to put away hatred. We have to put away deceit. And notice the next one, hypocrisy. That word, it, it means to act out the part. It's masking or hiding your true and maybe sometimes selfish motives. He says, look, sincere love, you got to put that away. Then the next word that he uses is envy. That's to be resentful, uh, resentful discontentment. You ever had someone that said they loved you, but every time that you shared something that was good or a blessing in your life, they treated you with resentment or maybe they were envious. That's not sincere love. He says, look, if we're going to love sincerely, we got to put that, that away. And the last one that he uses is slander. And this is usually where these sinful attitudes of, of malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy will eventually lead. We begin to tear other people down with our words. We begin to speak against someone else. We run them down verbally. And that's the idea that Peter is, is telling us this morning. And that is that if we're going to love sincerely, we, it's going to require hard work. And it has to be rooted in the word of God. And to love in that way, we've got to put away these things for our lives. Or they're going to end up leading us to a place where we're not loving others as we should. So think about those words. Malice and deceit and hypocrisy. Envy slander are any of these evident in your life toward other people if they are he says look you're not loving the way that god has commanded us in his, in his word you're, you're not loving him in a way that is obedient toward holiness and maybe that's because your love is rooted somewhere other than the word of god i want you to understand this very important truth today and that is you have the responsibility to lay those things aside. Notice what he says at the first part of verse one. So you put away all these things. And we have to allow God to work in us to help us with those things. But it's your responsibility to put those things away. God is not leading you in his word. God's spirit is not leading you to have hatred in your heart or to have deceit or hypocrisy or envy or, or to be slandering someone. God is not leading you in that way. You have to put those things away. In fact, I want us to just take a moment to write a prayer to God. Just write out, Lord, help me to love others with a sincere love. Lord, help me to love others with a sincere love. No hypocrisy, no malice, no deceit, no slander, no envy. Lord, help me to love others with a sincere love. Would you write that prayer out? Because sincere love requires hard work and is rooted in the word of God. Notice what he said in verse two. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. He, he uses an analogy here. He's not calling all of these Christians newborn babes, but he uses an analogy to help us understand how we should desire the word of God. I know when we had babies in our house, especially newborns, you don't have to wonder about whether they're hungry. They will let you know and they will scream and scream and scream and scream. And you might be warming up the bottle in the microwave and it's not getting warm fast enough. And I'm telling you, they will continue to scream to let you know that they're hungry. They'll do it in the middle of the night. They'll do it during the day. They'll do it twice, three or four times in an hour. It doesn't matter. When they're hungry, they let you know. And Peter is saying that's how we should desire the word of God, like a newborn would desire milk. And oh, that we as Christians would desire the word of God like that. 
In Psalm 1, verse 1, the psalmist writes, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight, his joy is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. That we would desire the word of God in that way, to long for it day and night, that we would delight in it and meditate upon it every moment of every day. That last phrase of verse two is so important. We have to desire the word of God so that we may grow up into salvation. In other words, take us to the point of maturity that our salvation calls us to. What's he saying? To grow in what? To grow in our love. Grow in our love for God who is so gracious and grow in love for his word, the sincere and pure word of God, and then grow in our sincere love for other people. Do you know why our love for others, I think, is sometimes so shaken? I think it's because our desire for the word of God diminishes. I find myself when I'm not in the word of God, when I'm not listening for the voice of God and longing for it and meditating upon it as I should, that's when my love for others begins to go down. That's when my attitude begins to sour. And so Peter reminds us to long for the word of God so that we can grow in our love for other people. What Peter does in these verses, he, he calls the believers together and he points out across the battlefield and he says, look, your fellow man, your fellow believers, they're not the enemy. The enemy is over there. The enemy of your soul who seeks your destruction, who wants you to turn away from God, who seeks the destruction of your family and marriage and the destruction of our culture. He is the enemy. We are called to love one another with a sincere love. But sincere love requires hard work and is rooted in the word of God. So let me ask you, is your love for others sincere? Does your attitude reflect the sincere, perfect word of God? Or are you filled with some of those things that Peter says we have to put away? Are you filled with malice? Do you have hate in your heart towards someone else, someone who's hurt you? Do you have deceit or hypocrisy or envy or slander? I read a quote, he said, strangely in churches where biblical teaching and theological knowledge are strong points, love and unity are often weak. Christians must strive for both maturity in knowledge and unity in love. And I can't help but see and understand and feel the timeliness of this passage for us today. I've seen a lot of people, especially on social media in the recent months, just tearing each other down. If someone disagrees with us politically, we draw the lines in the sand. And we say, well, yeah, that's what you think. You're over there and I'm over here. Uh, some people, you know, if they don't post something on social media, then they're called the problem or part of the problem. And in that language, we're saying they're the enemy. And, and then some people do post something on social media and then they're the problem. And so we draw the lines in the sand and we begin to, we begin to, to bicker with one another and so much infighting, even Christians fighting with other Christians. And, and Peter reminds us, and I want to remind all of you today that we need each other. And so we must remember the command of Jesus to love one another. Look, sometimes we're going to disagree. We're going to disagree on things that are happening in our culture. We're going to disagree on things politically. We're going to disagree on the way government handles things. We're going to disagree with each other's opinions. We sometimes are going to disagree on theological or biblical points. But what we must agree on is what Jesus called his disciples to in John chapter 13. That he called them to love one another. In fact, in John 13 and verse 35, Jesus said that the defining mark of Christians would not be their theological expertise. It would not be their knowledge of the Bible. It would not be the denomination of their church. He didn't say that the mark of Christians would be those that wear Christian t-shirts or post scriptures on their Facebook or social media page. He said in John 13, 35, these words, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. We need each other. 
And so because of that, we are called to love one another and love one another with a sincere love. Sincere love requires hard work and is rooted in the word of God. Sandwiched in the middle of all of this teaching is something interesting. In verses 24 and 25, Peter actually quotes from Isaiah chapter 40 when he said, all, fly, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. He's referring to Isaiah chapter 40 if you want to turn there and read it. But Isaiah 40 is a prophetic word of comfort and hope to the Israelites who would suffer under Babylonian captivity. And in Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah points them forward to the Messiah who would come. And when he would come, he would be the hope of Israel. And by Peter referring to it here at 1 Peter chapter 1, he reminds these believers that one day we will see the Messiah, that one day the Messiah will come. And so until that time, remember that we are to love each other with a sincere love and to live in obedience to the word of God. I want you to imagine what a difference it would make in the world if the church would live out what it means to love each other. Yeah, it's a theological stance that we're to love others. Yeah, that's what Jesus commanded us to do. But what if we practically lived it out before the world? What if rather than showing our differences, we, we chose just to love each other? Our purpose as a church is to reach as many people as we can and prepare them, uh, prepare the way for the return of Christ. We say it this way, that we exist to lead people to find and follow Jesus. Well, if we want people to find Jesus and to follow him, then we need to love one another. The world will know that we are Christ's disciples, not by the name on our sign, but by the love that's in our hearts. So remember this church, sincere love requires hard work and is rooted in the word of God. Let's pray that for us this morning. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for the love of Jesus that was put on display for us on the cross. That even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we were ungodly, and your word tells us in Romans 5, we were enemies of Christ. He still loved us and went to the cross. And so help us to love one another. Help us to love as Christ has loved us. Help us to be a shining light to the world. Help us, Lord, not to love in the flesh by our own feelings. Help us to put away malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander and to love you and to love others with a sincere love. Remind us today that sincere love requires hard work and help us to root our love for other people in the word of God. We pray that you would have your way in us and help us to love as you loved. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.